Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Welcome everyone to Joys Without Borders, to Colonia Roma, and to Mexico City. Welcome to the 2019 North American James Joy Symposium. We are honored to have you here. And of course, we are honored to have Carol Wade. Um, I'll be introducing her briefly. Um, she, will be, she will be presenting Out of the Wake. Um, Carol Wade is an artist living and working in the heart of Ireland. Since she graduated from the National College of Art and Design, she has had a passion for exploring how the cultural footprints of the Irish have evolved in layers from the bog road of Corley to the cobbles of Moore Street in Dublin. Carol has spent the past 12 years researching and illustrating the book of Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce. Working in oils, pastels, watercolor, and mixed media, she has created over 500 artworks based on the novel. She is a creator and host of the blog Blotty Words, Finnegan's Wake reading group on Facebook, and her exhibition River Run, which features a selection of her 500 wake illustrations, began in early April in Dublin. Um, without further ado, Carol Wade. Thank, thank you very much, and thank you, Mar Mario, for that. Um, there'll be a few updates on that. I've done a bit of work since. Um, I'm an artist living in Mullingar, uh, in exile from Dublin, about 50 miles away. I grew up in Dublin, and um, all my life I've been painting. I've been teaching art for, since my teenage years, and I've been painting... Um, various different types of art before I discovered Finnegan's Wake. My sister's down there. She's not paying attention. You're supposed to be changing the slides, woman. <laughs> She's multitasking. This is the type of work I would have done before. Um, I worked in portraits, uh, landscapes. I loved it. I loved creating a sense of realism. But like all artists, I went through various barren patches where I just found it really hard to be motivated and very difficult even to pick up a brush. Until about 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Until about 15 years ago, my sister Frances, she's Dr. Frances McCormick, although now she allows me to call her Frances. She came to my house and she opened a book, and she wouldn't show me the cover of it, and she said to me, wait till you hear this, Carol. And she began to read from page three of Finnegan's Wake. By the time she came to the end of it, I was absolutely enthralled. I had pains in my side from laughing, and I went, what is it? She said to me, I knew you'd get it. I knew it. And I did. I didn't get the, the, the meaning of all the words. I got the gist of it. And I think the, one of the most important things was I was brought back to a time in my childhood in Crumlin in my grandmother's house. I was about five years of age and all the adults were sitting around the fire and they were chatting and gossiping and I was totally bored as children would be. So I took myself next door to the kitchen and I sat down behind the door in the kitchen and I was looking at the flaking paintwork and I, you know, I love looking at patterns and textures and I was hearing the voices coming and going. It was a bit like a dream, going in and out of a dream. I wa and that was the, the effect that uh, Finnegan's Wake had on me. I was understanding some, not understanding at all, but it was really familiar, I knew the language. When I took to reading Finnegan's Wake for myself, those voices became the narrator of the book to me. The book that Francis had, The Finnegan's Wake, belonged to my father. When I realized that my father, who at 12 years of age had to leave school to begin work, that he had read this book, I realized that, well, if daddy could read it, anybody could read it, and I certainly was going to read it. So I began to read it without a guide, without any 
uh, without looking up on the internet any of the meanings of it. I just read it and enjoyed it the way I would an Italian opera. It's like, you know, I go to an Italian opera, I sit there, I have very little Italian, I don't read music, I don't play music, but it just has such an effect on me. It makes my chest swell. And that's the effect that Finnegan's Wake had on me. I love that book with a passion. Soon after beginning to read it, I began to sketch because these images flooded my mind. And the images were usually funny. They were a mixture of various different things, you know, the puns that Joyce uses. And I was seeing the strangest little things and I, was had, I had to write them down. For the next, six, uh, the next uh, eight or nine years, I began to draw images that I saw from Finnegan's Wake. And I converted them into watercolors and oil paintings. About five years ago, I decided that such a substantial work as this deserved a really big response from me. So like the farmer who throws his hat over the hedge so that it makes him climb into the field, I decided that I was going to buy an A3 sketchbook and I was going to illustrate Finnegan's Wake page by page, starting at page three and working my way through to the end. And to avoid being um, overwhelmed by it, I took my copy of Finnegan's Wake that Francis bought me and I cut it into three pieces, put two of them away and said, now I've only to do that bit. And I'm now at this point, I have 600 illustrations, paintings, drawings, not to ben mention the ones that I've thrown, uh, that I've destroyed for quality purposes. I have, um, I'm on my sixth one of these, and I'm halfway through the book. And I'm really proud of myself that I'm there, because some of the chapters were a struggle, like chapter eight, with, oh wait till I get to chapter eight, I'm gonna love the river chapter. And I spent a week thinking, what kind of an approach will I have to this? And I nearly, I stumbled at that, but I got there. So I feel I can, Francis thinks if I have four more years at it, I'll get to the end. And I hope, you know, because I want to get to the end, and like Finnegan's Wake, I want to get to the end and start again and do more illustrations. So I'm going to show you where it all began in some of my paintings. I may have to refer to the notes, I'm not sure. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to say to you is, I, am, I feel at this point a bit like one of the archaeologists that's working on the wake. I feel like Belinda of the Dorans. I'm that little hen, scratch, scratching about in the midden. I can't excavate the whole dump, but I can certainly unearth little gems and hopefully offer the loan of a lens so that I can help Finnegan's Wake be read by a wider audience. One of the first things I did when I told you that texture was very important to me. And I was looking at the texture of that first thunder word. And I thought, that's actually the effect that the wake had on me. I actually felt it hit me like a clap of thunder. And like thunder, you get this big bang, and then it rumbles and peters out. So I thought, well, how can I um, capture that in drawing? So what I did was I took the book and I photocopied the thunder word. And I enlarged it, and then I photocopied and enlarged it and enlarged it until this happened. And these are actual photocopies. Um, I just made this collage of them. And if you look what happens, you can actually see the ink splatter. That's not visible to the naked eye. And I just thought that is such a wonderful image of not just a thunder word, but of the whole wake. Nothing is necessarily visible immediately, but the more you look at it, the more you see. So I used the splatter. You can move on, Francis, thank you. I used the splatter in some of the words, and actually that became... No, it's not moving? Pointed at the... Ah, there we go. Um, I used the splatter 
Um, this, this is the, the first thunder word, word. And I used it. It became, it became part of my style of painting. And you'll see those little dots and dashes. This one here is um, from page, I think, oh, I didn't put the numbers on it. I think it's page um, 232. Does it say down there? Can you read it? Oh, it does, of course. Page 232. Right. <laughs> um, this is where Joyce talks about the uh, explosion in the four courts in, in Dublin. And he uses words like uh, chromat chromatis, soot, uh, monochrome, um, coal, tar pitch. So obviously I, had, I felt I had to do it in a, in a chromatic, in a monochrome um, palette. What happened was in 1922, Ireland got involved, where Ireland had a civil war. We had just gotten out of the War of Independence with the treaty. The treaty meant that we got sovereignty over 26 counties, but six counties remained within the British Union because they were mainly, um, they were mainly uh, Protestants. And um, there were a group of rebels that didn't like the idea of that, even though in one sense we had no choice because had we not signed that treaty, we would, would have been at serious war with Britain. And they took over some of the main buildings in Dublin. And one that they took over was um, the Four Courts. And the west wing of the Four Courts was blown up. They think maybe by the people that were in it. And what was in the west wing of the Four Courts, and I'm sure some of it's affected some of you who are Irish Americans or, are, or have ancestors in Ireland, the public records office was blown up and seven centuries of data, including um, births, marriage and death certificates, were all blown to the sky. Some of them went as far as Hoth, which was 10 miles away. Like a butterfly from her zipped clasped handbag, a wounded dove started from escaping her four co coats. I'll wail for you. Um, I just love the way that um, the, that Joyce has allowed me to use my second passion, which is history, and to look at the history of Ireland. Not only to look at that, but the local stories. So the next slide, um, this is one, this motif is the second thing that has affected my style of painting or, the, or my um, subject matter. There's that wonderful, I was saying to Francis today, when I, read Finnick, when I read Ulysses, I had to, I, it took me several times to read it because I got this smell, the smell of, the, of dirty Dublin. When I read Finnegan's Wake, I got a wonderful smell of pleasant things. And I think it came from the start of this, where Finnegan is lying in his, sist or Finnegan is lying in his grave. He's Finn McCool, his head is buried over there at Hoth Head, and his feet are over in the Phoenix Park. He's at the knockout in the park where oranges have been laid to rust upon the green since Devlin's first loved Livy. That is probably my favourite uh, quotation from the book, because it means so much. The, the, obviously, you have the oranges on the green, and that's, like, Ireland is made up of Protestants and Catholics. Catholics, all of the invaders that came to our country, with the Danes, with the Protest, with the English Protestants, and you know, less people think we're bitter about it. We're all a mix of all of that. We're all, we're all blended. You know, my my family would have thought that they were Catholics only until they did a little bit of research and discovered there's plenty of English Protestants there as well. And I just loved I just loved that. Because I had a little girl in school one time who said to me, Miss, I'm the only one in this school that's truly Irish. I've never been outside of this country. And I said to her, there's none of us in this room that's truly Irish. We've all come from other countries. Because Ireland was uninhabited until we got the people who came from the Iberian Peninsula. Anyhow, Francis, you can move on. So I've, I literally printed with oranges. I put the, the paint on the oranges and printed. And I used that motif 
in various different paintings. And these are very early ones of Belinda of the Door and in the Midden. And as you know, when she's in the Midden, she, the Midden suddenly turns into an orangery. And what I love, the idea of the orangery is a Midden we think of as a dump. But a Midden is also layers of history. And oranges are the most precious things for various different reasons. They gave life to the sailors who had to trans go across the seas. Um, but they also, when they rot, they smell absolutely gorgeous. And you know, potpourri means rotten pot. Well, it's a beautiful smell that people put in their houses and there's often oranges in them. So I've used that because it's the theme of recirculation. It's the theme of layers and history. It's the cycles of history, the layers of, of, of our ancestors. And so it became, it, it sort of became a motif that I use various, in many of the different paintings. In this one, for instance, up here, that's an oil painting and there's only a section you can see. Do you see the orange in that? That's the Musee Room. Um, as a child, I used to think that the Wellington Monument was a, a building that if we could only get, climb up high enough, we'd find the door to it. Um, so the Wellington Monument in this one is the Musee Room. And it's a very personal picture to me because the, moti the orange that's in that, hence when the clouds roll back, Jamesy, the orange is the clouds, is it the, what is it? But I made that, it's, it's actually a texture. And I made that by taking 19 years of gallery floor plans and tickets from around the world and putting them together in that wonderful collage. I covered them with gold. I don't know what's what, but I started picking at them so that I released little bits. And when I exhibited this painting in Dublin, people were begin beginning to find little bits of museums and galleries. And that's what I, I just love when art causes a com uh, starts a conversation. Okay, Francis, the next one, please. Here's another one of the Midden, and it's also a very early one. Stoop if you're ABC'd minded to this clay book. What curious of signs, please stoop in this alphabet. So in the Midden, you've got Germanic runes, Egyptian hieroglyphs, and here I've got Hain, Do, a three, a Cahar, a Cuig, a She, a Shacht, a Hocht, a Ni, a Je, the ancient Irish numerals. Kind of depicting the layers of the Midden. And what I love about this is Joyce is telling us to stoop and read it. If you can read it all, you can read Finnegan's Wake. You do not have to be an academic, you do not have to have studied anything. There's something in there for everybody, and even just the sound of it is there for you. And I just, I really loved that. Also, hidden in the middle, you might just see I've got uh, ALP and HCE. Okay. That was also inspired by a visit that I had about 25 years ago to an interpretive centre in County Longford called uh, the Coralie Bog. The, we have um, a board pneumonia and they are a group of, they, turf, they cut turf um, and have been doing so for many years to allow for uh, electricity and power in Ireland. And one time they had to absolutely stop what they were doing because they discovered a trackway. And they discovered this bog, uh, oak trackway in the bog and they, they, they lifted it up and it was, archaeologists came and they sent it abroad um, to be um, tested and to, to be preserved. But when they lifted it, they found, and that was an Iron Age one, they found a Bronze Age one underneath. And they lifted that and found layers upon layers upon layers going back so far, possibly as far as the, um, the first hunter-gatherers that came to our country. And I just love how we walk on layers of history of people who've been there before us. And Finnegan's Wake, Joyce has given us so much of that in Finnegan's Wake that you know, we can find those things. Next one, Francis. Belinda of the Dorans got a makeover. 
around page uh, 1110. What child of a strand looper would keep you little Kevin in the despondful surroundings of such sneezing cold would ever have trooved up on a strait that was called street, a motive for future sanity by euchring the findings of the Arda chalice by another highly innocent and beach walker while trying with pious clamour to wheedle tipper ra ra re ra Patooters out of New Zealand, in spite of the patch purple of the mascal. A jewel, a jewel to die today, goddamn and begot, sticks and stanks of the most high of the Jacobiters. There's so much in that, and um, this is one of the images that I have got from it. So, um, the Arda chalice, I don't know if you know about it, it was discovered. It's one of our very precious artifacts in Ireland. It was discovered in, in 1868 by two boys who were digging for potatoes. And um, they, they discovered this thing, and it was worth quite a lot of money. And I mean, anybody who knows anything about Irish artifacts will have seen this one. But at the same time, and this is where Joyce kind of mixes things together. At the same time, a strand looper, okay, so we'll say a lady on, a, this woman on a strand with her two sons found on the, the bottom there, the Tara brooch. And she was a bit of trickster, like um, Sean. She was a little bit of a trickster. She pretended that it was found on the strand, but although people actually think it was possibly found in a farmer's field, but she didn't want to give it up. And she said uh, it was found in, and they called it the Tara brooch when she sold it on. They said it was the Tara brooch because they felt that it would get a lot more money if it was um, associated with the seat of the High Kings in Tara, even though it wasn't, it was uh, in Betty's town in County Meath. So keep you little Kevin, the, the hen's chick, finds the Arda chalice and offers it to the father, pa passing it off as his own. And Belinda of the Dorans is based on the old Irish penny. And here she is again in this one from page 13. So this is Dublon. Do you belong? This is John Speed's map from 1610. And all you can recognize, even if you know an awful lot about Ireland, all you can recognize is the River Liffey in it. You belong if you can recognize the River Liffey. Doesn't matter if you're Northsider, doesn't, doesn't matter if you're Southsider. It's the history of all the people who have lived around the, ri the River Liffey. You belong. Um, and I have used all of the coins or various different um, uh, images from the coins. It was W.B. Yeats who headed the commission that chose the images for those coins when we got our free state. And it was Peter Medcalf's design that was chosen. And what I love about it was that those coins were shown for the first Irish um, coinage and the first Irish money. And then when we went into decimalization after that, they use them a second time. Um, oh, tell me all about Anne Olivia. This painting is a very large painting. It's actually possibly the size that it is there. And I was in the, the face is inspired by the Anne Olivia head that, and I'll show you a little bit of, uh, where that came from in a moment. And I loved the text. I loved the way there's an O and there's a delta. And I just, I'd never seen a book that was actually written in a very visual, or any part of a book written like that before. And it really captured my imagination. And I thought, okay, so here is the O. And I started to write, tell me all about Anne Olivia, tell me all. And I wrote as far as I could into the chapter, in a spiral, ending in a, you know, in a vortex, vortex in the middle of it. It was a very difficult thing to do. Um, I had to constantly turn it. Um, there was a lot of painkillers used when I was doing it. Um, it also reminded me of dendrochronology. You know, tree ring dating? In Ireland, there's a, a gentleman up in Queen's University of Belfast called Mike Bailey. And Mike has collected 40 years of dendrochronology, whatever, database. He's collected all that database and for 7,000 years. So that anything we find in Ireland, 
we can go to his database and say, oh, those three rings look like that, so that must be that date. And I just thought, well, it's got, we've got the river and we've got time uh, being marked. We don't know what year, but time has been marked in the three rings. The Anne Olivia head was... Um, The Anne Olivia Head used to be on O'Connell Bridge. At that time, it was Carlisle Bridge. And in the late 1800s, they needed to widen it. And when they widened it, they took the head off and they uh, stored it. Nobody thought, well, where is it? You know, uh, they made new ones to put, they made replicas to put there because it was too big and they want, they, the boats couldn't go underneath it. And it wasn't until the 1950s that somebody looked up and found that the originals were there on the Dublin fruit market, the Dublin tropical fruit market. That's the way it can be in Ireland sometimes, you know. Somebody said, let's just put them up there. We won't make a note of where it is. Sure, look, everybody knows it's there. And so in, in the 1950s, they were discovered. And it's on St. John Rogerson's Quay, which is down at the very end of the River Liffey. And the beautiful thing about it is she is there and she is seeing like the, the, she's up at the top, she's young, she's up at the top in Kapoor, she's down at the bottom where she's older and her face, I've made her purposely younger in this one, her face down there is that little bit older. In the 1950s something very interesting happened. Ireland were not in the Second World War but we certainly were affected by it. Um, my mother said that she never saw an orange or a banana until, she, until the 1950s. They were on rations. In, in the 1950s, a boat called the, Alexand the Abraham Lincoln came up uh, into St. John's Roger Rogerson's Quay to um, offload a cargo of bananas, but it had been stuck out of the port for such a long time, time that the bananas went black. And the people... Uh, and in there, they said they weren't taking them. So what do you think they did? They threw them into the river at the mouth of the sea. And all the children and the adults went diving into the Liffey to get these wonderful, precious black bananas. And the Garda Shikana had terrible trouble trying to keep the peace at that stage. Okay, next one. Um, two more slides. Oh, back one. <laughs> This is my second last slide. And here we have Finnegan. Okay, so you know what happened to him. He stuttered off the ladder. Damn, he was dud. He was drinking a bit too much, so he fell off his ladder and he was dead. I'm sure they had a wake. And in, on the wake, in the wake, they laid him bra down with uh, a buck of lips of Finnesky for his feet and a barrel load of Guinness's for his head. And here I've put him in a cyst grave, a Bronze Age cyst grave. In Ireland, you know, we have, you've probably all heard of Newgrange, have you? Yeah. So we used to build these amazing passage tombs. It took 30 years to build and they were absolutely magnificent until the Irish people at that time discovered uh, metal. And then they said, just bury them quickly. We've lots more to be doing here with this beautiful metal. So in the Bronze Age, they put them into these tiny little cyst graves and they had them in a fetal position. And in the cyst graves, they used to put these pots, I suppose pretty much like what they do in other, in other countries, these pots with things in for their journey. So I actually visualized poor Al Finnegan lying there in his fist, cyst grave with, this is an actual whiskey still from Gen, uh, Powers Distillery, where, I, where NCAD now is. And I used to sit under that having my lunch. So I decided he has to be, that, that's at his feet. And up at the top, there's a Guinness barrel at his head. And it's partially excavated, not fully. And then I, see, this is where I get these images. And, you know, I get really excited by it because it, I laugh so much when I'm doing them. When I was doing the next one, I decided I was going to go a little bit further. So I used the Guinness harp at the top kind of mirrors his bones a bit. And um, Johnny Walker Whiskey, I put Johnny Walker Whiskey boots on him. And the, the tagline for that is keep on walking. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one, I can show it to you another time. I, do, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but 
This, um, he, he also, uh, Joyce also talks about Richard, Richard III. And you know he was found in a car park there not terribly long ago. So when I came to that page, I have, it's the, the page with um, dear Ken John Peel. Well, not that that's not in it more than one time. But that's an actual, he had scoliosis and that's how they knew it was him. So I put him in it with uh, John Peel's um, bugle horn. And the last one, I'm going to leave you with the famous family, the Porters. It's gone. The Porters, so to speak, after their shadow stealers in the news beggars, are very nice people, are they not? Very, all foretelt. And on this wise, Mr. Porter Bartholomew, heavy manister and mackerel shirt, he, Ramat Peruke, is an excellent forefather. And Mrs. Porter, leading lady, a poop head, Gaffney Saffron night dressed, is up be chapelries, is a most kind hearted mess mother, a so united family, patter or matter, is not more existing on paper or off of it. I had to borrow. When I was reading this, not on that particular one, but earlier on, when I was reading something about the family and I was reading about the wise, about uh, Mr. H.C.E. being wise and Eve and, uh, and Olivia being the temptress like Eve, I got this vision of, you know, Gisli Bertus' uh, Saint Lazare Cathedral in Autun in Paris. Um, he did the most wonderful sculptures and I could see the figures like that so I borrowed heavily from them and she is based on Eve and Gisli uh, um sculptures and of course um, HCE has kind of taken on a different face altogether and he has the letter now I don't know whether he's putting it in the bag or out of the bag and um, we've got Shem and Sean and we've got Izzy or, or her reflection or and her reflection and just to point out here, you can see, probably not too clearly in this, but the little dashes, how I've used that, those dashes that were there from the beginning, they became part of my painting style. Anyhow, I just want to sort of finish with a couple of things. One is, um, I have brought with me today um, a couple of the watercolours that I've shown you here, and I'll have some outside, you can come find me, and, you know, stoop, if you can, I'll give you the loan of a lens, but you might need... Actually, when I was writing on them, I had a pair of very strong glasses that I couldn't, I couldn't see that way through, and a magnifying glass, and a really fine pencil, because I wanted to write so fine that you mightn't be able to see it. So um, you can have a look at that. And I've also brought um, some uh, four different types of little cards, because I just thought it'd be nice to have something from the conference. I um, just want to mention the last thing. Francis and I have a Blotty Words um, Facebook page, which I put onto my website then for people who are not on Facebook. And you can follow Twitter. What I really want is to open up that conversation. I really want to be part of the, all of you who love Finnegan's Wake. I want to learn from you. And I want to throw in my truppence worth. So thank you so much for listening to me.